Hi everybody. Uh, happy uh, Lazarus Saturday to you all. We're on the eve of Palm Sunday and the eve of Holy Week. Uh, so the pace quickens. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Holy Mysteries and this will uh, conclude our discussion and our reading uh, together of bread and water, wine and oil. Uh, I know we didn't uh, quite finish the book off, but uh, it's as far as we were able to get in the time that we had between uh, the beginning of uh, Theophany and, and now. So uh, here we are. Uh, our commander at Miletios uh, breaks the uh, holy mysteries down into their various different categories. Uh, Baptism, chrismation, confession, exorcism, holy communion, all of these things. Uh, so before we start with particular questions, uh, feel free to ask any general questions about the mysteries, and you feel free out there to jump in as well uh, with anything that you'd like to, to discuss. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting from the first part, uh, birth and baptism, uh, was the uh, relationship between uh, water and life and death, uh, particularly water as it relates to our physical birth, and then water as it relates to our spiritual birth. Uh, he points out that in the womb, a baby is protected by water uh, and uh, guarded, defended by water and lives in this, you know, peaceable, happy little water land. Uh, and this, has, this is intended to teach us something about the nature of baptism, about what baptism is, what baptism does. Uh, And this, this, this points us back to a, a, a broader point that I've made a couple of times about the relationship between spiritual life and the spiritual world and physical material life and the material world, which is that uh, physical life, material reality, is a kind of iconography of the deeper truths of the spiritual world. It's a kind of uh, pedagogy. In other words, the things, uh, the stuff of life, birth, sex, marriage, eating, drinking, all of these things have an immediate practical functionality, but they also have a deeper spiritual truth or significance embedded in them. And that's the real nugget that we're intended to extract from them. They're intended to teach us something about uh, what we are living into. Uh, they're intended to give us the shape or the feeling, uh, the sense of the spiritual life as we experience it only in, in, uh, incompletely, partially, as Paul would say, through a glass darkly in this life, but what we will experience more vividly and really in the life to come. So uh, they're not in, ends in and of themselves, uh, and they, but they all, and they all have a meaning that is beyond the, the, the thing itself. So birth, uh, the water, uh, the sack that the baby is enclosed in, obviously has immediate practical functionality. There are important reasons why that is there. However, the deeper spiritual meaning is, is, is tied to baptism and what God is doing for us in our baptism. And then what that means about what we are in baptism. So if uh, birth, physical birth, uh, is of a, of a baby that doesn't know anything and is tiny and helpless, then that is also an indication of how we come to the uh, birth into the Christian life. Regardless of how old we are, regardless of how uh, well-educated or how... Uh, sophisticated or intelligent we happen to be, when we are born into spiritual life, that's how we come in. Helpless little babies who don't know anything. Uh, 
and we have to grow and learn. And in the beginning, uh, that process is really simple and straightforward. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, you learn to say the words and you learn to copy the motions you see. Uh, like with the children, you know, you learn to make your cross long before you ever understand what the cross means. Uh, and the pace of change accelerates over time. Uh, but baptism is, or, or physical birth is telling us something here about the nature of baptism. Not only about what, what, what we are when we come to baptism, but then about what baptism is itself. When, it says, when, we, when we die to cry, when we die in the water and are raised to new life, uh, in having put on Christ, as the, as the service says, if any man is, uh, who is bapt uh, who, the person who is baptized into Christ has put on Christ. Uh, and that is like that protective cocoon around us that shields us from the destructive power of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, that is the uh, little cocoon that we have that shields us from these things. Uh, and so now we are, we are in a situation where we are no longer slaves of sin, as Paul says. We're no longer slaves of sin, uh, but we are uh, children of righteousness. And that's because the power of sin and death has been broken and we now have this little protective bubble around us. Uh, now, just like with a baby, you can poke at the bubble and get the baby to move. Uh, and you can uh, talk to the baby through the bubble. This bubble does not represent an absolutely unassailable fortress which it, through which it is impossible for the devil to make any impression upon us. But... We are beyond his control. Does that make sense? Uh, in the sense that he cannot uh, command us. He does not have ownership of us. Uh, I thought that was a, a really interesting connection and a really helpful one that he made between water in the womb and water in the baptismal font. Uh, there was a lot of interesting discussion in this chapter, about, uh, or in the early part of, of this chapter, about uh, ritual purity. Anything interesting strike you there? Was it different than you thought? Anytime I hear that, it makes me want to count the change in my pocket. And see if it's <laughs> because it's such a holy thing. I bet there's, I bet, and so actually I read some about that. Because I went through and I read some about um, Judaism. Mm -hmm. And there is a talk of that, but what, it seems that somebody did this tied in with the thing of um, that, um, the only time people really should have sex is when there's a chance of having a child. So, hence, at the time of menses and things, but also some of it, the thought was right after birth. And so some of it was tied into this notion of it's not correct to be sexually active during these certain periods. But Judaism has all this stuff about blood. I mean, that's, that's yeah. the, the whole, that's why you have kosher butcher shops, is yeah. that the, the animals have to be slaughtered in a way that removes all mm -hmm. the blood from them. So there's this funny thing, I don't understand it exactly, but there's this funny thing in Judaism that has to do with blood. And that's what leads to ritual purification, the mikvah, a woman has mm -hmm. to go to the mikvah in order to become right, ritually clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's specific to Judaism. I don't think that's. Yeah, so there's some of that. And then. Um, so is there also something about the... Um, so it's interesting that in Judaism, it turns out that um, if you have a male child, you do not have... You have a shorter time of maturity. I don't know if they call 
whatever that is. It, whereas if you have a female child, it's long. So but that's an interesting thing. That's probably something that the Orthodox Church and Gaia would think it is, right? I mean, oh, sure. It definitely it did. The period mm -hmm. of purification. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so, so my guess is that there are probably multiple reasons why this is in tradition. And one of these is the idea that uh, birth is such a holy event. But I think there's other things that don't make sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and the, whole, the whole question with blood it comes from the, the Leviticus when, when God says the life is in the blood. Right. So blood is identified with the essence of the, the livingness, the beingness of a creature. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, you, you can never eat that. Or you should never eat the being of mm -hmm. an, uh, the life of another thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, there, there's, there is an orthodoxy, uh, the reception of these ritual purity laws, particularly related to menses or uh, the uh, abstaining from church attendance, uh, is uneven. It hasn't always been done, and it hasn't always been done in the same ways, in the same places. So it's uneven. Uh, Pope Leo the Great, uh, in one of his letters, uh, roundly condemned the notion that a woman should be forbidden to come to communion when she was uh, ha on her menstrual cycle. Uh, the, the, he, he roundly condemns this idea, uh, that that should be the case. Uh, which obviously points out if, if he had to roundly condemn it, then that means that there were people at the time who were, who were at least raising the question. So it, it, clearly this is the kind of thing that, that has been going back and forth. Uh, and in our day, it's, it's not commonly done in most quarters of orthodoxy uh, that I'm familiar with, that women, are, uh, that women abstain when they're on their menses, on their period. Uh, the 40 days after birth is a, a, a still a much more commonly practiced tradition. Uh, and some of the reasons there that are not so spiritual make the best sense in terms of... Uh, Uh, I mean, people didn't have necessarily, uh, they didn't articulate things in medical terms, but they had very good medical intuition in some ways. Uh, you know, to keep the baby at home, away from other people for the first 40 days is a good idea. Uh, to uh, have time to develop that mother-child mother, mother -child bond through nursing, especially, you know, a lot of women have difficulty establishing that. Uh, in periods prior to modern sanitary conditions and sanitary products, it's very hard to be clean mm -hmm. and to stay clean if you're a woman who's given birth. So going out is really not an option in the first place. Uh, but there's also an old canonical prescription that you get around in this way. Uh, the, the canons, I think it's one of the apostolic canons, says that if you miss three Sundays in a row, you're excommunicated. Mm -hmm. uh, how widely that was ever practiced outside of uh, very small villages or, you know, I, I don't know. But uh, this uh, admonition of the woman to stay home for 40 days gets around that, that, that canon as well. So there are a lot of, a lot of reasons. M most of, the, of the, the good ones, I think, in, in some sense, more practical. Uh, but there is... In the notion, uh, the orthodox notion of sin, something that relates here that may be helpful. Uh, the word amartia means to miss the mark. Uh, you know, like an archer shooting at a target and you don't hit it. Uh, missing the mark is it's something you can do on purpose. It's something you very often do inadvertently, unintentionally. Uh, and missing the mark is not a strictly moral category. In other words, what, when we think, when we use the English word sin, 
we, we, we almost always think of this exclusively in moral terms. Ten Commandments, uh, good, bad, right, wrong, right? That's the way we think of it. Well, it's, it's not only is it volitional, but it's something that's morally wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, telling you a lie so I could cheat you out of your money. Or, you know, uh, punching you in the nose because I'm angry. Whatever. Uh, the, the word amartia is a broader category than we typically think of the English word sin. Uh, a lot of the sacrifices that are, that are that, for which you, that, that you make in the Old Testament are for accidents that happen, that have, no, that have no moral dimension to them. Like your neighbor's cow fell in your ditch. Uh, well, you've got to make restitution for his cow. Mm -hmm. You didn't do something morally wrong, mm -hmm. or at least not any worse than perhaps just running out of time or being careless. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a restitution that has to be made. This, this missing of the mark has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> It's impossible to live this life and not miss the mark in some ways. Uh, those categories of missing the mark that we think of as moral and volitional, it's certainly it's possible to avoid those things uh, m most of the time, or in most cases. Uh, most of the time you don't have to murder anyone. Uh, most of the time, or, you know, for most people in most of their lives, you know, there's never a situation in which you need to uh, covet your neighbor's wife. That just isn't something that really you have to do. So those kinds of things you can avoid. But there are a lot of things that come from living life that are sort of unavoidable. Uh, that cause, that wound us in a certain way or that uh, impair us in a certain way that's just a byproduct of what we, what we went through or what we did. Uh, PTSD, for instance, is not a sin, but it certainly reflects a kind of brokenness uh, that is the result of what the person went through. Uh, This kind of missing the mark or brokenness, if you want to speak of it in that way, is something that touches all aspects of our life because of what happened in the beginning when we became creatures who ceased to bear the glory of God. And so we became disordered ourselves and, and then everything else became disordered along with us. So... Uh, God identifies a couple of those consequences in the garden. Uh, women will have pain in childbirth, and men will have to struggle for their bread. The ground will sh send up thorns and shoots, and it's going to be hard labor for you in life. So, if we want to take particularly what brought about this discussion, the issue of sex and birth, uh, these things are uh, blessed by God and part of the God-given reality. However, they are colored by the nature of our broken world in which they wound us more than they were supposed to, in which we are wounded by them in ways that uh, are not, for which we are not morally culpable, but nonetheless they reflect a wound or a an impairment. Uh, so, when we talk about impurity, we're talking about something that very often reflects the fallen nature of life, but that does not necessarily connote a moral failing. Doesn't necessarily indicate a, a that you've done something bad or wrong. Just that what you did or what what happened to you has has uh, brought you into a, that has created a wound that has to be healed. Uh, since blood is identified with life, any time you are wounded physically, this is a problem, certainly to the Jewish mind.
because your life is spilling out on the ground, and that's not where it belongs. Uh, so anytime a woman gives birth or has her period, it's a reflection of a kind of woundedness that doesn't necessarily bear any uh, moral uh, weight, doesn't connote any, any kind of volitional sin or any, any kind of uh, moral problem, good, bad, something like that. Just part of the reality of the world that we live in, in the, in, as it is as it is distorted by the fall, in which one of the one of the problems is is, is the nature of childbearing. Uh, so, uh, impurity. Uh, there's certainly that strain in the tradition, but it doesn't connote a moral failing, or a moral problem on the part of the woman. Uh, Anything else about birth and baptism that you wanted to talk about? Did you notice how he talks about the symbolism of water? Water is both a symbol and an expression of life. It's a very potent, potent experience of life, but it's also something that can be symbolic of you know, death and danger. Uh, you know, it's the difference between a babbling brook and a raging sea. Uh, and, both, and, and in this way, water is a, is a perfect vehicle for the whole action of baptism or of entry into life in Christ because something dies and something is made alive in baptism the old man dies with all of his lusts as Paul says uh, and a, the new man is, is brought to life and so water makes a perfect vehicle for expressing that because water is both an agent of death and of life uh, it's the most powerful solvent in the world uh, you know, it, it is all of these things that represent both. And so, uh, but there's something else going on here in God's use of, and, and this, is a, this is a step back from exclusively baptism to the broader view of the mysteries as a whole. Uh, God uses these uh, material things, water, bread, wine, oil, uh, you know, and grapes and grain and all the things that they're derivative of. Uh, he uses these things as ways of conveying his grace, which is his own divine life, to human beings. So he uses these finite material substances to convey his grace. And there's a lot in that that's worth reflecting on. Uh, in, a, in, in the sense that what is, he, what is he teaching us about reality by, by choosing to do it that way? In other words, instead of, you know, uh, we say prayers and then there's this big flash of light and all of a sudden, you know, we're all filled with the glory of God. Uh, you know, God could do it that way. Uh, you know, there could be little balls of fire that come down and rest on our heads like at Pentecost or something like that. God chooses to convey his grace in this way through bread and grapes and wheat and olive oil and things like this. Uh, why, what does that mean? What, what significance is there in that? Why well, use ordinary objects rather than miraculous objects? That's what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Well, because it reminds us, I guess it makes life itself a miraculous event. It, talks, it makes the ordinary things that we do with, it makes us look at them and see them as beautiful and miraculous rather than as ordinary tools that we use every day. Right. It, the, it, it, cause, it, it sort of compels us to look at these things in a different way. But not, I think, to say that God can take something ordinary and make it extraordinary, but to say that in the kingdom of God, there isn't anything that's ordinary. Everything in the kingdom of God is extraordinary. Everything in the kingdom of God is shot through with his glory.
everything in the kingdom of God is a means of grace, is a bearer of divine glory. And Maximus talks about this, that uh, when God is all in all, nothing will be deprived of his glory. That everything will be filled with his grace and everything that God created is capable in its own unique way of bearing the glory of God. Again, how can you say that the world is filled with the grandeur of God? Yeah. The world is filled with the grandeur of God. But the sacraments, the mysteries, show us the world as it is intended to be rather than as we normally experience it. Water is always intended to be, in the, in the economy of God, apart from this fallen world, water is always a means of life, always a means of uh, participating in the glory of God, always a bearer of God's glory. So is bread, so are grapes. Everything is always a bearer of the glory of God. Uh, nothing is just an object, just a thing. There isn't any just a thing in the kingdom of God. Everything is saturated with the glory of God, his own life, and is then, therefore, fully alive and fully itself in whatever way that God has made it to be. I mean, we're talking even down to rocks. There is nothing that is simply materiality, meaningless material object in the kingdom of God. So the sacraments reveal reality for what it, is, what it really is made to be. Uh, in the eschaton, what things will be, uh, rather than as we normally experience them. So they show water as with the full true character of water, as life-giving, as, as, as a means of grace. They show bread for what it is. Uh, but these things also convey that to us in a, in a, in a very uh, finite way when we partake of them in, in, in this life. So again, it's back to that whole issue or that whole point that what we experience in our finite physical life points to something, gestures to something deeper and more meaningful. Water is certainly a means of life for us when we're thirsty. Uh, you know, if you've been wandering in the desert, like in those old movies, Lawrence of Arabia or whatever, you know, very vividly is water conveying to you that it is the, it is the necessity of life. Uh, bread, you know, we have to have bread to live in. Bread is the quintessential classical image of sustenance. Uh, if you can't get by, if you don't have money for anything but bread, you still you can live. Uh, so these things are bearers of life, even in the limited finite sense of this world. But that only points to this other sense in which they are bearers of life, in, 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 the, in the sense that they are bearers of divine life, bearers of God's glory. They are, they are uh, containers, they, they are hallowed. Everything in the kingdom of God is. Uh, so the mysteries reveal to us the true nature of everything in the kingdom of God. They reveal to us, the, and, and they show us also then that they deny the uh, ancient heretical Gnostic idea that the flesh, that materiality is bad, or that what is really the best, the best truest thing is is spirit, and what's physical is only to be endured. Uh, this is not true. Uh, the spirit has primacy, particularly in human beings that have a, a spirit that endures. But even physical objects can be bearers of the grace of God even things that are not human. Uh, we know that humans can be bearers of the grace of God. Even after their death, their relics can be bearers of the grace of God. But God is showing us here then that also that it isn't just the essence of things or the spirit of things or the idea of things that is redeemed. It is actually the whole of reality in all of its material and physica physical beingness that is redeemed, restored, made a whole and what that looks like is shown to us in what baptism is, in what communion is, uh, in what uh, all of these sacraments are. They show us reality as it is meant to be, things as they are restored. The, they're, they're a vision of paradise, or a little bit of paradise breaking into this world, like we talked about before. Does that make sense? Yes. 
So there's a lot to the fact that God chooses to use uh, physical realities. He says in the book, in the chapter on baptism, he talks specifically about original sin and says that the Orthodox Church doesn't accept the doctrine of original sin at all. But when you talk about the fall and the world being, or the universe being, an imperfect place because of man's imperfection, it sounds a lot like original sin. How is it different? I, I, I actually disagree with him here. I think there is a way of articulating original sin that the Orthodox Church certainly rejects. Uh, and that notion uh, comes down to us uh, through Augustine. And Augustine was wonderful on many points and is a saint of the church, indisputably. Uh, but he made some errors in certain things that got picked up on a lot later on in a way that was probably not quite what he would have expected. Uh, when Augustine articulates how it is... So, so th there's a question that the early church fathers have. How does Adam and Eve's sin affect us? And that the, how, how are we responsible for that? Or wh why are we responsible for that? In what way are we responsible for it? Because we talk about the fall... And the, uh, the scriptures say that, uh, you know, in Psalm 50, we're all born in sin, or in iniquity as the uh, common English translation has it. Well, how is that the case? What does that mean even? Augustine said that his, his articulation of original sin is that uh, sexual intercourse as a means of generation, it comes after the fall. And that in that concupiscent act, we pass on... Uh, the like the, the spiritual gene of original sin. Uh, this notion of original sin is not something that the Orthodox Church has ever taught or accepts. What the Orthodox Church does teach is that when man lost the glory of God, he was no longer a bearer, a container of the glory of God, as he had been in the beginning. And this is what it means when it says that they looked and they saw that they were naked. Simeon the New says they were robed in garments of light. And, when, and that was the Holy Spirit clothing them. Uh, when they sinned and they tried to take that life that, to, as their own possession, they... Uh, okay, I'll get to it in just a second, Ruth. The, quest, the question was, uh, how is the... The, the author says that the Orthodox Church doesn't believe in original sin. Uh, the question was, is that really true? Because it sounds like, from what we talk about the fall, that what we're talking about is very much like original sin. And I'm saying here that I disagree with the author, uh, and that we do have a concept of original sin. It's just different than the uh, common Western uh, articulation of what original sin is. Uh, the later reformers will uh, nuance that Western idea by saying that we inherited uh, his guilt because we, were, we, we, we broke the contract with God and that contract could not be restored apart from Christ. And so everyone was in a state of broken relationship with God uh, because the contract had been broken. The, the pact had been violated. In the Orthodox Church, what they'll say is that Man lost the glory of God. And when they lost the glory of God, all they had left to pass on, so that when they lose it, they, they become less than fully human. Because what a human is at its core is a creative bearer of the glory of God. That's an essential part of what it means to be human. When they lose that, all that they can pass on through sexual generation is the biological, graceless life that we have apart from God. So, original sin is the life that we have apart from God, apart from that grace, and there's nothing that we can do to change that. Does that make sense? So, it's, it, it's, it's original sin in the sense that we are still, and we're passing on a state of life that is apart from the grace of God. 
and is apart from what it means to be fully human. So we are passing it on in that way. We're passing on purely biological and mortal life. So, uh, yes, the Orthodox Church certainly has a concept of original sin. It's just articulated in a different way. It's articulated in an ontological way as opposed to a... in an ontological way that bears then moral consequences as opposed to, say, partic- a, 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 an especially uh, legal or contractual mm-hmm. way. Or a purely sexual way, like sexual generation is the problem itself. That's what Augustine is going to say, is the sexual generation is the problem itself. Uh, but Augustine had a particularly fraught sexual past, and so perhaps it's not surprising that he was a little suspicious given mm-hmm. where he had come from. Uh, what time is it? Uh, about 14 minutes till 5. 14 minutes till 5. So we have about five more minutes uh, until we have to get ready for the next thing. Uh, and we're not going to get through all of these chapters. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are, do you, are other questions that you had? Uh, we can talk about any of any of the questions. Uh, that was a really good one, though. Well, I have a small procedural question. Um, some Orthodox in, in the church, church abroad, confession was always required before you went to communion. Mm-hmm. But it, that's not true in the Orthodox Church. It's it's not so. The question is, uh, what's what's the relationship between confession and communion? Is it a one to one relationship? Do you have to go to confession before every communion or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, Historically speaking, that was not always the case. And even in the church abroad, it's not done now in that way. I know a lot of uh, church abroad priests uh, and even uh, at least one church abroad bishop who does not do that. Uh, Bishop Mark of Berlin uh, gave, uh, I read somewhere, I read an article by him or an interview with him in which he said about once a month, if for somebody who's going to come to commun- communion every Sunday, mm-hmm. about once a month is what he puts down as the time when they should come for confession. Uh, so, uh, but this, this relationship, I'm going to go ahead and cut the video off here. Well, I'll leave it going, but we're, we're still videoing over here. Uh, so, uh, in the early church, everyone who remained at the liturgy for the whole liturgy was communed. Uh, that's why we send the catechumens out, we close the doors. You know, when we say the doors, the doors, and wisdom let us attend, that was the signal to the doorkeepers to shut all the doors. Nobody comes in after that point. So everybody who remains past that is staying for communion. No one stays in the church who isn't going to be communed, except for the kneelers at the back, the penitents. Um, so in the early church, everyone was communed who stayed. Uh, and there wasn't a one-to-one. There's n- there are no early church documents that talk about a one-to-one confession-communion relationship. When the monasteries become the primary uh, conveyors of orthodoxy, the, the last bastions, when the, the empires fall, and all you have left is the monasteries, uh, the practice begins to get much, much stricter for lay people than it had been before. Uh, And the, you get, a much, you get a, a, an increasingly heightened emphasis on the holiness of communion and the unworthiness of the receiver. Uh, and so people begin to take communion much less frequently, and they begin to really amp up the ascetical practices surrounding their participation. So, for instance, I knew people in seminary who came from kind of old-school Greek or Russian families. They communed once a year on, like, uh, Palm Sunday or Holy Saturday or something like that, and they would fast for a whole week leading up to it. And they would, uh, you know, they were very strict. And they wouldn't watch any TV or, or do anything. And they would, you know, it was just very, very intense. And then they would make their com- confession and they would have their one communion for the whole year. Uh, so that's a much later development. And it's a development that increases in intensity over time until you get to the Kolivadis fathers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Kolivadis were a movement of Athenite uh, elders who were convinced that uh, the faithful were not participating in communion enough. And as an example of not participating, 
in the church that I was brought in at, they told me that years before, uh, it was very normal for the priest to come out and say, in the fear of God and faith and love, draw near and turn around and go straight back in the altar. In other countries, the priest might say it while he's moving, like he wouldn't even stop. He would, turn, he would come out, hold up the chalice, turn around and say, in the fear of God and faith, and go right back in the altar. No one was ever receiving communion. So the Kolevadis were convinced that this was not a good thing, that people ought to be participating. And they began to emphasize uh, that this was important and that you should be doing it. Uh, and there was a lot of pushback at the time, but that idea began to catch on. And in Greece it began to catch on, and then in America it began to catch on, particularly through the works of Alexander Schmemann. Uh, so it was something that was practiced uh, for a period of time in church history and was retained later in the church abroad than in other places. Uh, but it's something that is dying out even in the church abroad and in the broader Orthodox world. Uh, as Do you know that was the, it was the uh, custom in the, in the Byzantine Catholic Church, so that goes back to at, at least to the time when the Byzantine Catholic Church separated from the Orthodox Church, which is like... Oh yeah, no, certainly. It, 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 it's, it's, it's pretty old in the sense that the, the, uh, this tradition uh, goes back to probably at least the 15th century. Uh, yeah, but, but the monasteries took over sort of as the bastions of orthodoxy, well, right. you know, after the empire fell. So from that time on, this, move, this trajectory, we're on this trajectory. And it's only, it's only as monastery and church begin to separate again after the Ottomans fall or after post, you know, post, post communist Russia or that or in, in parts of the world where you didn't have that kind of oppression and orthodoxy begins to grow, it's only as these two things begin to separate into, into distinct entities again that you begin to see the difference in practice emerge again. Well, I was surprised that in churches in Greece, it looks like confession is a pretty rare thing, but the Greek priests just don't do it hardly at all. Uh, in, in Byzantine practice, you always had some priests who were assigned to confession and the rest uh, were not blessed to hear it. Uh, and the way that's identified is if a priest has an epigonadium, uh, the diamond-shaped uh, vestment that hangs off the right side, that means that priest can hear confessions. If they don't have it, they can't. Uh, but in general here, at least over a fairly long period of time, there's been a difference in the Russian and, and Byzantine practice, which is that Russians tend to like to have a very like time-based rule for confession once a month, or every fasting season, or, you know, how, whatever you want to say. And the Greeks have a, a, a sort of a, a, a more, uh, the, the Byzantines, have generally, and speaking, speaking of broad strokes, generally favored a more, I feel like I need to go to confession kind of a model. Uh, more, it's more based on conscience than time. Uh, but they also, in, in the Byzantine tradition, they also had a much, generally speaking, a much, closer uh, relationship with a spiritual father, a monastic elder, or somebody that they would go and they would just talk to, like on a regular, or write letters to on a regular basis. They have tons of these things. That was very, very common in that tradition. Uh, so maybe not confession so much, but because they had monasteries all over and it's not a very big place, you often had a very close relationship with the monastery where you would go for advice or counsel, even if not for confession. Okay, we're out of time, guys. Uh, good strength in Holy Week, and we will uh, have a new class probably sometime in the summer. Uh, I'll let you know. God bless you.